Fellas, we are excited to have Andrew Marcinic on the show tonight. Say welcome to Andrew. Welcome, Andrew. Welcome, Andrew. All right. Well, thank you. It's great to have you on the show, Andrew. Before we jump in, I'm going to let our audience know a little bit about your background. Andrew is currently the Chief Information Officer at Worcester Academy and Worcester, Mass., most recently, Andrew was the Chief o Open Education Advisor for the U.S. Department of Education. In that role, Andrew focused on accelerating the adoption of open education policies within the department and across the federal government. As part of this campaign, Andrew organized a White House event that launched a national movement called Hashtag Go Open and brought together ed tech companies, district and state leaders, and nonprofits. His ultimate goal is to increase the creation uh, and sharing of open educational materials by educators throughout the country. Prior to that, he served as Director of Technology, Instructional Technology Specialist, and Secondary English Teacher in schools in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. Once again, Andrew, welcome to Ed's Not Dead. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you guys for having me. Good did, to be here. Did I get that right? How, did I have any uh, glaring mispronunciations in your biography, or did I do okay? <laughs> no. No, it's perfect. You even got Worcester correct. Okay. Great. Yeah. Usually take three or four times for that. <laughs> okay. I had to practice. All right. So let's let's dive right in. Um, we're fascinated by your bio, and we know you're going to have a lot to share that's going to be interesting for our listeners. At Worcester Academy, as the chief information officer, you note that, cla that classrooms should support the philosophy of active, pur purposeful use of technology. And that students are not just consumers of what's on the screen, but they create, design, and author their own learning, which I've always subscribed to. But at times, Andrew, I feel like when I go in classrooms and I see tech used, it's, it's high involvement, low learning kinds of technology use. So tell us what that, that creation, design, and authoring of tech looks like and sounds like from your experience in a classroom. Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, yeah, it's something I've always believed in as well as, as far as uh, my, my philosophy has always been around active use of technology. Um, you know, I always, I always try and look back to, to learn about how I'm going to go forward with a new technology. And I, I'm, I'm, I always think about what was it like when the, when the first lead pencil came into the classroom? Did, you know, was there all this, this hype around the pencil? And, you know, we have, we have pencil-based learning and, and all these new things. And, the, the answer and is yes, it. there was. Yeah. Do you think yeah, there, were, were, there, were there people that were anti-lead pencil introducing? <laughs> I'm sure there were. I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of issues with that. And I kind of see technology as the same thing, whereas, like, when a pencil comes into a classroom – it's not always on stage. It's not always the, it's not the, um, the catalyst for the learning. It, it, it's a supportive tool. So um, actually on the last pod here, we found this article, they did a study in Finland um, that pretty you know, unequivocally said that in Finland, at least, they found that digital-based uh, curriculum actually impeded learning. They did a big rollout of technology in Finland and um, you know, found that it hurt outcomes. And amongst several reasons, but one was just the kind of like distractibility um, that the technology element brought into the classroom and that students from either lower socioeconomic backgrounds and or immig immigrant backgrounds were disproportionately affected. So I guess you know, the question I suppose is, is what's the response to that? And, and you know, how can we strike that balance um, in the classroom of using technology um, and is there a right or wrong way to do it so that it doesn't impede learning and, you know, you're not doing it for, for its own sake, but, you know, for an actual outcome? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, I'll first start by saying that, you know, Finland gets a lot of attention. Everybody wants to be Finland. Uh, I don't particularly. Um, I think they do. <laughs> I agree they do. with you. It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> Finland does what they do very well, and they're ranked in this kind of arbitrary uh, algorithm that puts them at the top of the PISA score. And that's, that's great. And it's fantastic. But in, in America, we have a lot of different um, situations and, and instances where um, we can't really always apply what's happening in Finland or even any other country uh, in, in, and slap that into our Amer American system. And so I think the question here is, is balance and really trying to leverage the technology for what it is. And, and one of the things I, I feel is uh, difficult is that we're trying to bring some really amazing technology into an old, uh, old pedagogical approaches and, and curricula. Um, and so, you know, I was actually reading a book with, with a group of my colleagues um, called iGen. 
And there's a real heavy focus on, uh, you know, how these screen, screen, screen time and, and a lot of, and a lot of uh, video game time is, is really destroying kids and setting them back, uh, and actually causing a whole generation of kids to grow up slower than before. Um, and phones is, is, you know, and causing the stress and anxiety and all that stuff. And, right. and I thought about, and I, and I looked at like, I looked at a classroom and you see this technology in there and there's this amazingly powerful tool, tool that used to fill a room that now resides in one's pocket. And, and it, it's an interesting, um, place where we are. And I think we're at a real pivot point in where this is going because, I, I, you know, I think we need to think about how we restructure what a school looks like and the, who those players are. So I made a proposal in our book discussion to hire five new positions to our school, like effective next year. This isn't really going to happen, but this is just like my, my wish list. And I right. said every school should hire a game theorist. They should hire a creative learning director. They should hire a pedagogical marketing um, a specialist. They should hire an academic analytics uh, specialist and a digital psychologist. Wow. And 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 I think the idea of what you see is like, you know, teachers are constantly looking at like, well, how do I balance this? I'm, I'm not familiar with it. And, and I think it's sometimes the fear of the fear of the unknown and the fear of uh, the vulnerabilities that come with technology and not knowing something. And and that's OK. And like, you know, my job in my my line of work is we're here to help you. We want to guide you. It's not all about the technology. Ultimately, the best I've always said this with one to one device is a dynamic teacher. And yeah. and so technology technology in purposeful, meaningful ways. Um, but I think it's also trying to harness the power of the things that we're pushing back against, like too much video games and, and too much things. We need to harness those powers. Like what made the phone what makes the phone and social networking so appealing that we can't, you know, use that and leverage that and bring that into into our um, instructional design in every classroom. And I, th- um, I think what you're referring to almost seems like what kind of balance are we asking teachers to make in their daily instruction, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and in your previous work, you, you worked to integrate one-to-one technology. Was it iPads or was it like Chromebooks or how did that work for you or in your yeah, experience? Yeah. Um, it- it worked well. It was interesting because um, I've, I've found in, in the many one to ones that I've been a part of and, and have rolled out that it's usually the um, uh, well. At least this was in, in 2011 when we rolled out the iPad one to one at Burlington High School. Um, we rolled that out uh, grades nine through twelve, and I found out that a lot of the students really didn't acclimate to the iPad that well. Um, they they just felt it didn't really work for their their workflow and their system that they currently had. Um, and I get that because they were at the point in their academic careers where they were, they were focused on college. They were focused on the practical things. Um, and it wasn't a lot, it wasn't as much as a project based type of atmosphere. It was focused on, it was really, I mean, let's be honest. It was focused on the grade, getting the grades and getting the transcript ready for Harvard. And, you know, what I've seen though is in middle schools, I've seen that work really well. I've seen the iPad work really well because it's a, a dynamic device. The pressures of, of the grades and all the, the college acceptance and is not there yet. Um, and so I think the, 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 it works, it works better there. Um, but I think it's, it's ultimately, uh, you know, and again, I've said this a lot of times, it's, it's, it's a culture shift. Uh, right. This is a big transformation. Um, and it, you can't just expect technology to come in and work magic. And you have to, you know, really, you know, get, get, find the faculty who are really on board with it, find the ones that are really excited about it and, and leverage their excitement and, and have them in front of the staff, have them leading instruction, have them leading professional development days. So how do you, how, so, so from your perspective of, uh, of in leadership, how do you create that environment? Because bringing in one-to-one to a school that wasn't one-to-one can be overwhelming for, for students and, and certainly staff in a lot of ways pressure to use it um and then they when they do use it can be frustrating when you don't see it enacted because we spent all this money on these these devices How, what does it look like from a leadership perspective um from a leadership perspective i mean it is it is a lot of coaching um it, it is it was a lot of coaching and kind of uh bringing them along um surrounding them with resources finding uh, external uh, professional development to go and meet other teachers who are also incorporating and using technology in a one-to-one environment. Um, you know, I find, you know, 
teachers who go out and visit schools uh, and visit um, other, um, you know, other 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 classrooms and get to see how technology is being used in a variety of ways. It's it's really um, it's really powerful. And then you know, to have them come back and say, "Oh, wow, you know, I really I went and saw this at, at you know Shrewsbury High School or, or Grafton, and right. and it's really great. Like I, I have all these you know great new ideas, and I also have somebody I can talk to. It's like I have this like EdTech pen pal, yeah, um, that I can reach out to and. And it's really kind of, you know, within your own school, it's trying, it's building a community, but it's also looking around, you know, you know, especially Massachusetts, like a lot of districts, we're not that far from each other. Um, and so we have the ability to visit each other's um, uh, schools and districts, um, you know, when we want to. So um, I think it's really trying to create that ecosystem, uh, both internally um, in your school, but then also having that, you know, broader network and, and, you know, getting getting your faculty to get out there and see see how it's being done. So let's talk for let's look ahead a little bit and talk about the future. So you know, certainly in your role at the Department of Education, um, you worked in in the Go Open campaign and about open. I assume open source software is that correct? Uh, well, it was more more lean towards. Um, this was part of uh, President Obama's uh, Connect Ed plan, and the the four, one of the fourth uh, one of the pillars of that was. Um, to provide um, uh, educational resources that are adaptable and modifiable uh, okay. for all educators. Okay. So really looking at uh, open licensing, Creative Commons licensing for educational materials in place of overpriced textbooks. So I guess just on the horizon, like what's what's next? What should we expect to see? Is it kind of just continued and more open access for more students and teachers across the country and just kind of a shift away from the paper and pencil more to the digital or... Is there some other horizon that you foresee um, happening that will, you know, kind of like be another large shift, just another one along the way um, in, I don't know, towards digitalization or just the inclusion of technology? Well, I think the, the, the biggest change I'd personally like to see in education is that I feel like we've, since I've been in the profession and, and even in my research, historically looking back at the education profession um, and timeline, we've constantly been trying to retrofit um, new ideas and new technologies into a uh, kind of a old static system. Um, and, Amen. you know, we, 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 we still, we still measure kids ability to move on by their age. Like how, why are we still doing that? We talked that? about that. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we're still doing that. Like, because, like I, I'm, I'm eight years old, so I should know these things. So that's why I'm moving along. That's why I, I, I'm going, I'm going to high school next year. Why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm growing up. I mean, that's apparently why. Um, I don't know what I know, but I'm going there because that's just uh, that's how old I am. And so, like, we're, we're, we're doing that. So that's one thing. I was like, we need to group kids based on their skills and competencies and and what they can actually do at certain, uh, at certain benchmarks throughout their academic journey. And it's not this race race you know, geez i almost said race to the top yeah. and then i almost like i no, i, I no almost threw up a little bit in my, <laughs> i threw up a little bit in my mouth sorry um it was like so natural like you can see like you're like oh my god pump the brake the yeah. brain is it's like, coming it's coming from what nah, you're about to say. i said it um you know shout out to arnie duncan loved working with him for him he's an amazing <laughs> guy um but not that one not that not race to the top um but uh no i so that's one thing i'd like to see you know, we had a uh, we had Dr. Charles Fidel um, speak with our faculty a few um, a few months ago, and he was really kind of showing kind of where things are going, like future wise. And it was really fascinating to see him showing this kind of these mind blowing things of like, yeah, these contact lenses that will overlay a virtual world that you can know about everybody and whoever. And it's like people are like, whoa, that's amazing. It's like, well, that's actually being already created. And so, how are we going to teach to that? And and so it, I think, you know, we started a, like a complete reexamination of the courses we teach and what we're teaching, um, why we're teaching it. Um, you know, why are we still teaching Shakespeare? Really? Do we really need to teach Shakespeare now or should we be no. you know, teaching Uh-oh. philosophy? <laughs> we're going to tick yeah. off a lot of people with that comment. <laughs> I know. That's well, this, the next one will probably tick off even more people is because like, go, like, Andrew, why go. Like, like, <laughs> pretty soon machines are going to be able to code. So like this whole idea of like everyone can code is about to go out the door. And so like, <laughs> why don't we, why don't we, why don't we flip that and say like everyone can code ethically 
and so that they don't become the next Mark Zuckerberg and take all of our data and sell it for profit. Ooh. And so that's where, sorry, Facebook. Um, <laughs> we should have gotten into this earlier. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So I just leaned into that one, Cheryl yes. Sandberg. But, um, oh, look at that. <laughs> that's, that's low. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bazinga. <laughs> yeah. So, um, no, but, that, but uh, bring it back a little bit. That We need to really reexamine a lot of our courses. And, and we actually did this with, with Charles Fidel and our faculty where we looked at well, what, are, what, are, what are the things we want to, what are the courses we would love to teach? And we basically had this exercise where the faculty was like, they brought up all these amazing courses. Each content area was great. And then, then, then came the tough part where it's like, well, what do you have to give up? And so um, that's where it's, that's where it's going to be done. Uh, that's where it's going to be difficult. But um, so that's pedagogically, that's where I'd like to see education go. Um, just like blow up it, blow it up, blow up public education um, and, and just make it, make it better. Start from the ground and go forward. Um, and uh, as far as technology goes, it's not stopping. Um, it's only getting better and more immersive and even more personal. Um, I just recently purchased an Oculus Go headset and I'm blown away. And I said, said to myself, what, why can't I just learn in this mask? Why do I need to you know, do anything else. I can completely learn in, in, within this environment, and it's amazing. Um, and uh, obviously, there's a whole social emotional aspect to that as well that I'm leaning out. But um, that's where things are going. It's becoming way, way more personal, um, but also scarier on the aspect of, of privacy and um, and data data mining. Well, um, we're gonna other- we're gonna forward all that information to our friend uh, listener, uh, friend of the pod, uh, Betsy DeVos, because she's a big listener of ours. So. Well, we're yeah. on it. Yeah. All right. Great, uh, great. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it'll get filed right to her death. Yeah. She'll love that. Um, Andrew, <laughs> Andrew uh, this has been awesome. <laughs> For our listeners, where can they find you? Do you have anything uh, currently that you're working on that you'd like to put out there? Um, nothing Nothing at the moment. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm on Twitter occasionally. I've kind of stepped back from that uh, a little bit. But Come on, I'm on Andrew. I'm, I'm on I'll get back. I know I need to come up with a new hashtag. Um, but I'm on I'm on Twitter at uh, A N D Y C I N E K. That's Andy Cynic. Uh, not because I'm cynical, but out of the last five letters of my last name. And, <laughs> That's um, good. I like that. The only reason I the only reason I had that because it was because it was back in the day when there were only we were only allowed to yell 140 uh, letters out into the world and have everyone listen. Um, you know, I had to really try to truncate my name so I could get more more in there to say more. Um, yeah. um, but, um, and then, you know, I blog, uh, um, I blog on medium a little bit. Uh, I've, I've recently started to, you know, kind of start to write again. Um, but every time I start to write blog posts, I feel like I'm Frank Constanza at the uh, Festivus airing of grievances. And I'm just <laughs> like, I gotta stop. This. I gotta just stop jumping on my blog. and just to complain. Like, here's, I have a bone to pick with all of you people. <laughs> and, um, hmm. So, uh, but yeah, you can you can catch me on my blog there if you if you'd like. Um, and uh, yeah, and if anybody ever wants to reach out and you know have me come in and do a lesson on Facebook Live, I'd be happy to. Ooh, oh, nice, nice. We'll, nice. We'll, we'll tweet it out in that in that sense. Nice. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Cool. Well, it's been great to have you on the show, Andrew. Uh, hopefully, we'll get you back and keep up the great work. And thanks for joining. It's not dead. We'll talk to you soon. Awesome, guys. It was a pleasure. Good to chat with you. For a thanks. Bit. Thanks, man. Take care. <laughs>